Hello, and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson House Speaker Series. My name is Elizabeth Karcher. I am the Executive Director of the Woodrow Wilson House, a site of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Today, we have a great talk uh, about Edith Wilson. She was actually what I call the first curator of this house. And it is really my pleasure to welcome uh, our guest speakers. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know uh, a little bit about what's going on at the Wilson House. Um, we have the speaker series is continuing. It is always held on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. And we've got notable historians, authors, curators, and leaders, uh, and they are exploring social movements of the early 20th century and their relevance today. The talks explore women's suffrage, activism and protest, racial inequity, and the consequences and legacy of Woodrow Wilson's presidency. The speaker series is brought to you through generous donations from Carrie Fuller, Nancy Bliss, Ed Gerber, and Chris Keller. Uh, we have today with us Rebecca Boggs Roberts and Heath Hardage Lee discussing Edith Wilson, brave, beautiful, and complicated. Do you know that Edith Wilson lived an extraordinarily life? She was one of the first women in Washington, D.C. to have a driver's license and drive her own car. And yet she did not know how to ride a bike until she was taught by the president in the basement of the White House. She was the first first lady to vote in a national election since women did not get the right to vote until 1920. And yet she did not support the suffrage movement. Today, we're going to learn about this amazing woman whose calling card simply read, Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our uh, first presenter, and that is Heath. Uh, Heath Hardage Lee. Uh, and uh, she and I met two summers ago when I very first started working at the Wilson House. And we sat down and we talked about a biography that she had intended to write about Edith. And so we got to know each other then. Heath comes from a museum education, preservation and program background. She holds a BA in history with honors from Davidson College and an MA in French language and literature from the University of Virginia. Heath is an independent historian, biographer and curator. Potomac Books, a division of the University of Nebraska Press published Heath's prize winning book, Winnie Davis, Daughter of the Lost Cause in uh, 2014. Heath's narrative fiction book entitled The League of Wives, the untold story of the women who took on the US government to bring their husbands home from Vietnam was published by St. Martin's Press in April of 2019. Heath was the 2017 Robert Dole Curatorial Fellow and her exhibition entitled The League of Wives, Vietnam POW and MIA Advocates and Allies about the Vietnam POW MIA wives. It premiered at the Dole Institute of Politics in May of 2017. The exhibit is currently traveling through 2023 to museum venues all over the United States, including the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. Actress Reese Witherspoon and her production company, Hello Sunshine, in partnership with Sony 3000, have optioned the League of Wives for a feature film. Heath is an executive producer and historical consultant for the project. Heath's next book is a new biography of First Lady Pat Nixon, and it's expected to come out in, from St. Martin's Press in 2024. She's most recently worked on the project with the, the Smithsonian, uh, and that is uh, uh, Madam President. It is season two, episode three, uh, and it was on the Smithsonian Channel's America's Hidden Mysteries. With that, I'd like to welcome Heath Lee. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for having me here today. And thank you to the Woodrow Wilson House. And thank you also to Rebecca Boggs Roberts for joining me today. Uh, Rebecca is Edith's biographer and is working on an amazing new book about Edith and her life that I myself cannot wait to read. Um, but I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about Edith's early life to get us started today. So I've got a few slides we're going to look at, and we'll bring those up right now. 
All right, so let's get right into it with this wonderful old daguerreotype um, that I have of both William and Sally Bowling. So just to go way back in time, uh, William and Sally are Edith's parents, of course, and William was really born in the Southern planter elite class pre-Civil War, and he actually descended from Pocahontas. Later on in Edith's life, this would be one of her major claims to fame. Uh, and being a Virginian myself, being related to Pocahontas is uh, American royalty. It's It was then, it is now. So that was a, a major thing that Edith talked quite a, a bit about um, later in her life. But this comes from her father William's side. Post-Civil War, William lost his money and his land like, like so many did um, during that time, and he turned to the law to support his family. He moved the family from the family plantation in Lynchburg, Virginia, to Withville, Virginia, quite soon after the war was over, and he became a circuit court judge. But Sally, his wife, was really found herself in reduced circumstances, and she at times had to even take in occasional boarders uh, to make ends meet. This was difficult because they lived in a very, uh, in very cramped quarters in a, a tiny little second floor residence above three commercial spaces on Withville's Main Street. This even today is part of the Edith Bowling Wilson Museum, and, and you can still see where Edith lived as a small child with her family. So let's go to the next slide. Now, I love this picture. This is a very young Edith. She's probably about three years old here in pants. Um, if you know anything about Edith Wilson, she was extremely feminine. So the idea of putting Edith in pants kind of makes me laugh because she clearly is angry about it. You can see it in the slide. She is not happy in this outfit. Um, there are, uh, is a lot of speculation about why she would be wearing this. Um, she perhaps had to tend the fires in the house and these pants were sort of a safety precaution. But more than likely, this was a hand-me-down from one of her brothers. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, Edith and her family were in relatively reduced circumstances after the Civil War. So they would have all been wearing hand-me-downs, um, even the girls and even uh, if they were female, they might be wearing these. So probably it's a hand-me-down situation. Edith is not pleased with this as, as we can clearly see. She was uh, the seventh of 11 children um, of William and Sally. So there was, was quite a crew living in Withville above those commercial spaces. Two of these children died in infancy. Um, so again, it, it was a very, cr very cramped circumstances, a, a extended family living in Withville in this tiny space, often with borders. So um, Edith had to learn to become flexible and became used to um, helping with all kinds of things around the house, the fires, tending the fires, helping with food. Um, and we'll talk a little bit next about what a major caretaker she became for her grandmother bowling. Now, very, very important to Edith's life are both of her grandmothers. Um, the entire family, it was an extended family that lived in these apartments um, above the commercial spaces in Withville. They had up to 20 people at a time living in this very small space. So they were all together quite a lot, probably more than any of them wanted to be. Um, Post-war, the two grandmothers, Sally's mother and William's mother, both, um, I'll talk about various reasons why, but they both ended up living in Withville with Edith, with William and Sally and all the children. So we'll start with William's mother, Ann Wigginton Bowling, grandmother Bowling to Edith. So she was sort of the ruling matriarch, ruling the roost here. She was widowed in 1862, so before the end of the war, but she moved in with William's family and moved with them to Withville. She was incapacitated as a young woman. Edith says in her memoir, it was probably from a riding accident. So there was some kind of spinal injury and grandmother Bowling had to have um, help really all the time, night and day. 
Um, Edith became her favorite grandchild. There were many, many children. Edith was um, one of seven. Two of, of these children, Sally's children, died in infancy. But there were a pack of children in the house. Edith was Grandmother Bowling's favorite, uh, Lucky Edith. I, I think this was a dubious honor that she had because she literally took care of her grandmother 24 seven night, day, anything grandmother bowling wanted, Edith was sort of at her beck and call. So this does um, form a lot of her caregiver tendencies that come into play later with Woodrow Wilson. So in addition to taking care of her grandmother, her grandmother had 26 very annoying canaries that I'll talk about a lot today. And that was part of Edith's charge is to take care of the canaries as well as her grandmother. In Edith's book, my memoir, which I, I will continue talking about a lot today, Edith later said of grandmother Bowling that she was, quote, an unusually capable and dominant person to whom an obstacle meant only something to overcome, end quote. Again, very, I think that quote is very indicative of Edith's personality and how much it was formed by this very demanding but loving grandmother. Um, her tendency also to, to form strong opinions, I think, came from grandmother Bowling. Um, and the role of women, both of the grandmothers, I think Edith absorbs this from this close relationship with both of them. Now let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about her other grandmother, Grandmother Longwood. So Grandmother Longwood is the one I think who forms the majority of Edith's ideas about a woman's place. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. She was Sally's mother. Um, she was widowed in 1860 and lived also with the Bowlings in Withville from 1866 on. She was very tall, very dignified, very ladylike. She was the one who was always telling Edith to sit up straight, you know, to have good posture and never to show her ankles, God forbid. I mean, who knows what could happen? So she was very strict about prop propriety, um, how you were dressed, all of that kind of thing. Um, despite the pants episode earlier, usually Edith was dressed, you know, in a very ladylike, dignified manner. Edith remembered her very fondly for her cooking, for her delicious coconut balls and praline. So I think she indulged Edith and the other children with those from time to time. And that made quite an impression on Edith. She really absorbed ideas from her about the feminine ideal. Um, and I think particularly the idea about uh, the cult of true womanhood or the cult of domesticity, which you will read and learn a lot about in the 19th century. And this sort of prescription for women at the time said they should be pious, pure, and submissive. So Edith is absorbing this really from both grandmothers, I think more strongly perhaps from grandmother Longwood. But what I think is so fascinating about Edith is there's this sort of push-pull within her. Like she knows about this cult of domesticity. She knows about the cult of true womanhood and she kind of buys it on the surface, but she is very opinionated, very much wants to do what she wants to do. Um, and Rebecca will tell you about some of her, her later life that she demonstrates really the tendencies of the new woman of a more liberated, maybe more enlightened uh, feminine ideal. But these two things are really at war with her, I think, a lot during her life, different phases of her life. So I find that that quite interesting. But this is where she gets that early training um, in the uh, pious, pure, submissive mode, which she does not always follow later in life. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, and we're getting pure canary here. So Edith with the bird cage. If you go visit the museum today, you will see these bird cages. And she is thinking how much she hates these darn canaries that are the bane of her existence. Uh, I think I would be remiss if I did not really emphasize this. Um, as I said, one of her many jobs as grandmother Bowling's caretaker was to clean out these canary cages and take care of the creatures. 
Um, her favorite thing in the world was when the canaries died was to have canary funerals for them. And uh, when I did the Smithsonian documentary, if anyone watches that, I have my daughter, Ann Alston, um, we'll talk to you later about how completely strange she thought this was. We talk a lot in the documentary about how there must have not been a lot to do in Withville at the time, because this was um, Edith's major amusement and her brothers, they all loved to have canary funerals. And again, to quote from my memoir from Edith, her quote about the canaries, quote, what was to me the greatest hardship of my young life? taking care of the cages for 26 canaries and acting as providence for them in births, deaths, and the raising of their broods. Personally, the only real fun I ever got out of the canaries is when we would find a young one that had been crowded out of the nest and lay stark and hideous on the floor of its cage, awaiting burial. We would put the little dead bird in a spool box, place it in our red wagon, and have an internment in the bird cemetery. We would go to the marble yard and get a chip cut from a big slab and write on it the name and date and the death of the deceased. I mean, it sounds like fun to me. I thought it was very, very creative. I think it shows a great sense of humor that Edith had. So um, I enjoyed talking about this with my daughter who I'm not sure if she found it quite as amusing as I did, but I know Rebecca also has a love for the dead canaries. So um, I think they're a recurring theme that will come up quite a bit um, during our talk. And let's go to my last slide for today. Um, I love this picture of Edith as a young woman. Here she's probably between 18 and 21. She really is a beautiful young woman. She has kind of a Elizabeth Taylor look to her, these sort of violet eyes. And, you know, she's very shapely. Um, I think Witcher Wilson, you know, obviously is very smitten with her later. And she did have um, a, a first husband before Witcher Wilson that Rebecca will tell you about. But I'm just going to talk you through her schooling or lack thereof in some cases before she comes to her first marriage. So in terms of her education, she was homeschooled by her father, William, who read out loud a lot to her, a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of plays and grandmother Bowling, who was really in charge of her education and I think really screwed up her French. Um, I have an MA in French and I was distressed to hear about grandmother Bowling's French English sort of mix. Uh, it was mostly re reading French, not speaking French. So I'm not sure that Edith got that completely correct but I give grandmother Bowling points for trying to educate her in French, which was what young ladies at, in the 19th century needed to have. Um, at 15, though, she finally stops. Really at age 12, her parents decide that Grandmother Bowling is really wearing her out and she needs a rest. So she gets more of a break from Grandmother Bowling at that point. And at 15, she's sent to Abingdon, Virginia, to a boarding school that was then called Martha Washington College. This has now evolved into Emory and Henry college, but at the time it was a boarding school, and Edith absolutely hated it, um, despised it. She only stayed for one semester. She said they were way too strict, um, narrow-minded. Um, I think the rooms were very cold. This was very true in the 19th century. Uh, in one of my other books about Winnie Davis, uh, another 19th century woman I read about, um, she was in German boarding school, had the same issue where Really, Sorry. it was freezing, kind of freezing cold in the mornings when the girls would get up. There was never enough food at these boarding schools. So I think Edith had some legitimate gripes there. But I think she also was used to kind of doing her own thing. And it was much too strict for her. So she came home after a semester, stayed home for two years, and tried again at age 17. And this time had a much more successful time when she went to Powell's boarding school in Richmond. And she loved this boarding school. One, because it was in the big city of Richmond. She talked about, you know, the seething sea of humanity she saw there. So Richmond at the time was, I mean, it was, and it was a big town. It was very much the big city for a girl from Withville. Um, and loved the school, but unfortunately, the headmaster got into a streetcar accident and injured his leg very badly. So the school 
was shut down. And she later would say this was the happiest time of her life. And she made a lot of lifelong friends that she kept up with from this school. Um, she was very sad when they were forced to close. She went home and her family said they really just did not have the money to continue to send her to school. They needed to send her three brothers to school. So that was really the end of, of Edith's schooling. And I think she really did regret that she didn't get to do more at Powell's. I think she would have stayed if she could have. So I'm gonna wrap up my part there, but I want to introduce you to my friend, Rebecca, who is writing a fabulous new biography of Edith Wilson. And we're all super excited to read this, but I wanna just give you a little background first on Rebecca before she talks about Edith's later life. Rebecca Boggs Roberts has been many things, including, but not limited to, a journalist, a producer, a tour guide, a forensic anthropologist, an event planner, political consultant, jazz singer, and radio talk show host. Currently, she is the curator of programming for Planet Word Museum. She looks forward to creating a new institution that will become part of the intellectual and cultural life of our capital city. Uh, Rebecca lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband, her three sons, and a big fat dog named Sassy, the chocolate lab. And she also has a new dog, Woodley, who is her pandemic dog. So I will let Rebecca take over. And um, thank you for Elizabeth for having me today. Heath, thank you so much. And with any luck, neither Sassy nor Woodley will participate in our Zoom today, but all bets are off when we're all working from home. Who knows? <laughs> so what Heath didn't say is she has been incredibly generous with me. Um, she got sidetracked from Edith to write about uh, Pat Nixon and has just been so wildly open and collegial in introducing me to the people she's met in the Edith re research she's already done. And we get to talk about how much she hated those canaries and <laughs> uh, <laughs> try to get some sense of this complicated woman. And, you know, I came to Edith because I've written two books on the suffrage movement and people always ask me about Edith when I do talks on suffrage. They ask if maybe she was whispering in Wilson's ear and that's why he came around to the suffrage cause later in his presidency or, um, you know, did, did she influence him in some way or if they know she was anti-suffrage, which she was, um, they wonder how this, you know, confident independent woman justified being anti-suffrage, um, which is a conundrum, um, absolutely. But I think that Heath really is getting at something with this warring instincts of this cult of true womanhood and this, um, you know, what a nice girl does with the reality of the 20th century modern woman Edith actually was. And, you know, people say that the first lady, since it has no job description, often reflects what the ideal woman in America is at that time. And the ideal woman in you know, 1916 to 1920, when Edith was first lady, was really evolving. And so was she. Uh, and I think that the people who concentrate on the 15 months when Wilson or 18 months, if you go all the way to Harding's inauguration in 1921, when Wilson had his stroke and Edith was his gatekeeper, you find that episode sort of shocking, right? Um, you can you can make an argument that the Madam President stuff is a little overblown. She wasn't actually making policy. She wasn't necessarily doing anything that Wilson wouldn't have done. But the fact remains that um, she insisted that the nation not know the extent of his health problems. She wouldn't hear of Vice President Thomas Marshall having any role and the 25th Amendment didn't exist, so she couldn't be pushed on that. Um, and she was his gatekeeper deciding what business of the country got done during that time. Um, and he was not up to the task of doing the job he was elected to do. And to the degree that anybody was doing the job that Wilson was elected to do in that time, it was Edith, who of course no one had voted for for anything. So if you just take that chapter from Wilson's stroke in the fall of 1919 to the inauguration of Harding in March of 1921, you think, what is going on? Where did this woman come from with this lack of informal school, of formal schooling? Who did she think she was? Well, who did she think she was? She thought she was an independent, accomplished, confident woman. And if you look at her whole life, you realize that there is example after example after example of her showing you who she is. So in 1892, Edith comes here to town. And Washington in the 1890s was 
booming. It was a fascinating place. The city had been so beaten down by the Civil War that there was real talk of moving the capital west to St. Louis maybe. And so the city fathers led by the notorious Boss Shepherd went on a crazy public works project to try to make Washington livable and appealing. So they graded and paved the roads, they insist, in, instituted a sewer system and street lighting. And so there was money pouring into the city. There was a sense that it really was gonna be a world capital. And also socially, a lot of those brand new Gilded Age, robber baron fortunes that were being made, those people couldn't break into society in New York and Boston. The Knickerbockers in New York and the Brahmins in Boston wanted no part of them, no matter how rich they were. But you could break into society here in Washington. It was a much more fluid caste system. And with the comings and goings of administrations, and it just wasn't as old a city, right? It had been founded right around the turn of the 19th century. So there weren't people who had six generations of family here. So if you read again, you know, or for the first time, I hope not, uh, like Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, um, which is all about how claustrophobic New York society is, one of the characters moves to Washington where she can breathe a little and remake herself. And that was the world that Edith moved into. Now, Edith was not rich, as Heath said, but she was young and beautiful. And 1890s Washington was a pretty interesting place to recreate yourself. So she loves it. She loves the music. She loves the buildings. She loves the Gilded Aid mansions going up, uh, up and down Massachusetts Avenue. Rock Creek Park is formed. The zoo is opened. The Washington Monument is finished. This is just an amazing time to be a young, beautiful woman in this booming, booming city. She tells a story in her memoir of, uh, there was a soprano she desperately wanted to see and she couldn't afford the ticket, but at the last minute, one of her sister's friends has a seat and says, you can have it if you get to the theater by eight. And she's so eager to go that she doesn't even bother to change into evening dress. She's wearing a green plaid dress, which I think is in the collection at the Woodrow Wilson house. And she tells the story that we can all relate to where she's trying to get on the herdic, the city herdics were these crazy horse-drawn buses. And uh, it won't come and she's running late and she's sure she's gonna disappoint her friends. And then she finally gets on the herdic and everyone who gets on doesn't have exact change. And she's going crazy watching the conductor slowly count out the coins and it's getting later and later. She finally gets to the theater. It's all so magical and wonderful. She doesn't even care that she's you know completely inappropriately dressed. And then she floats home on this high from this concert and she finds her sister and her sister's husband sitting around the table with her sister's husband's cousin, Norman Galt. Again, Norman, who kept showing up. She was not enamored of Norman at first. By all accounts, he was a perfectly nice guy, Norman Galt. He was solid, he was kind, he was decent, he was a successful businessman, and Eva did not warm to him at first, but he sure was impressed with her. And he kept showing up and kept sort of making his case. And she could do a lot worse, you know? And she really didn't want to go back to Winsville. Uh, She does briefly. There's a couple of years of kind of back and forth and will she or won't she? But finally she marries Galt um, and he owns Galt's jewelry store, which those of you who uh, are from here in Washington know was an institution. It was sort of the Tiffany's of Washington for 200 years. It just closed in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and was founded in 1802. So, you know, when Washington was basically a construction site, there was still Galt's. And so he's a person, even though he's in trade, which society people are snitty about, he's a person of some substance here in town and he's financially secure and he loves her. So she marries him and they have one child who doesn't survive and that leaves Edith unable to have more children. So they enjoy the life of secure, pretty well-to-do childless folks in Washington. And Edith really likes that life. Um, she becomes the first woman in Washington to get a driver's license. Uh, the driver's license is in the collection at the Birthplace Museum. I see the Edith Bowling Wilson Birthplace Museum folks are here on the call. So you can go see this down there in Whitville. <laughs> um, this is from 1904. And uh, she not only has a driver's license, but she's driving in the, is this little electric car. She called her little electric. And these were these two seater, not much more than a golf cart, frankly, uh, that were marketed specifically to women as a sort of easy to run little runabout um, that gave you some measure of independence. 
And Edith loved her electric. She talked about it all the time. There were a lot of women riding bicycles at this time. If you read other memoirs of turn of the century Washington, there's a whole big fad of bicycles and what do you wear to ride your bicycle? And do you, you know, actually become so unladylike as to wear that bloomer outfit and all of that? Edith wanted no part of the bicycle. She tried to learn later in the White House in the basement, and never actually mastered it. Uh, but this little electric car was perfect for her. And she became so known actually for her little electric car around town that the policeman on 15th Street would stop traffic for her. And she has a great life. She's really enjoying it. And, you know, biographers talk about her very frivolously in this time, which makes me nuts because yes, she was interested in beautiful clothes. And yes, she had lovely jewelry. She was married to a jeweler but also she's supporting her entire family at this point. Three of her brothers work for Galtz. All of them are supporting her unmarried sister, Bertha and her mom. She is the total bedrock of the family. Her father dies during this time. Galtz's father dies during this time. They are keeping the entire structure going and she is responsible in this very uh, demanding way that she doesn't get credit for at all because people just keep talking about her clothes. So she's, you know, enjoying being a woman of some means, but she's also very responsible for her largely impoverished family. In 1908, Galt dies um, and Edith inherits Galt's. This is still unusual in 1908. Married Women's Property Acts only were passed by all 50 states around the turn of the century. It was still considered a little suspect for a woman to be the executor of her husband's will and to solely inherit a business like Galt's. Had she had a son or had Galt had a brother who wasn't an invalid, they might've made a case to sue for the inheritance of the business. And she could have had to fight that. As it happened, she wasn't in that position, so she was able to inherit Galt's, which was a profitable business, but um, Norman had bought out his brothers and his father um, to become sole owner, and he still owed on that debt. Even though the business was turning a profit, he still owed uh, the shares that he had bought out of the other owners. And Edith kind of dithers about what to do. Um, should she sell the business, pay off the debts, be done with it? No one would have blamed her. She lived in a world where of the majority of Americans thought women were too stupid and fragile to handle running a business. Um, but again, her brothers work there. Her mother and sister are dependent on the earnings her brothers and she make from this store. If she pulls the rug out from under Galt's, the whole fragile balance comes tumbling down. She knows nothing about running a business, but she's completely confident that she can handle it because at every stage of her life, she's confident that she can handle it. She had no business moving to the big city. She had no, you know, no business doing any of this, but she just thinks I'll figure it out. I trust in my own smarts to figure it out. And she consults with the manager of the store and with her lawyer and they figure out a way for her to basically take nothing out of the business for a few years to live very frugally until the debts are paid off and the profit of the um, jewelry store is able to run itself. And she makes it happen. She gets out of debt. It's a going concern. She doesn't have to sell. She doesn't even have to borrow money to make this happen. It's impressive. And she would have been completely forgiven for bailing entirely, but she doesn't. So 1909, 1910, 1911, 1912, she is, God, is she gorgeous? She's gorgeous. Um, she is enjoying being a independent childless widow of means. Legally in Washington, I mean, in America, that is actually a very unusual status in terms of the level of independence a woman can achieve there. So for a white woman of her class with no debt and no children and being a respectable widow, she is free. She can travel. She doesn't need chaperones. She doesn't need to explain her spending to anybody. She can just go live her life in a way that her peers could not. And she absolutely makes the most of it. She goes to Europe every year. She goes with her sister, Bertha. She kind of takes on a, a ward of sorts, a young woman named Alice Gertrude Gordon, known as Altrude. Um, Altrude's mom had died young. Her father was a friend of Edith's. When he was ailing, he asked Edith to take care of Altrude. They really liked each other. They were good traveling companions. Um, and Altrude was dating Carrie Grayson, the White House doctor. Um, 
And Edith was very involved in their court troop because Al Altrud sort of ran hot and cold. She wasn't totally sure about Dr. Grayson. Um, and Edith was constantly staging ways for them to meet, um, including in 1914, she took Altrude on vacation in New England so that they'd be pretty close to where the Wilsons took their summer White House in Cornish, New Hampshire, so that while Grayson was tending the Wilsons, he could come see Altrude not too far away. But as it happened, Grayson couldn't get away because Ellen Wilson was so sick that year. Um, and Ellen, but so Edith knows of the Wilsons, has this connection, but hasn't met them. Ellen Wilson dies. Carrie Grayson starts telling Edith how lonesome the president is and how at sea the women in his household are. Uh, that um, the two younger daughters have married and moved out. The oldest daughter, Margaret, is around back and forth. She isn't always around. She has a singing career. She kind of moves around. There's a cousin, Helen Bones, who is more or less acting as White House hostess. She's kind of in over her head and they're in mourning, right? They're, they're sad. Um, and Grayson says, they need, they need a friend. You should be their friend. And Edith says, I, if they need people to introduce them to Washington society and take them to the right parties and stuff, I'm not the right person. I've never been part of that society and I have no interest in it. And he says, no, they need someone to like take walks in Rock Creek Park with. They just need a companion who will make them laugh and be good company. And Edith was that 100%. So she becomes friends with Helen Bones and Margaret Wilson to some extent. And whether Helen Bones and Dr. Carrie Grayson actually engineered this meeting or whether it truly was an accident, opinions differ. But at one point, uh, Edith and Helen come back from a walk in Rock Creek Park and almost literally run into Grayson and the president coming back from playing golf. The president down like timber, in love immediately, just so taken with Edith Galt. And She's a little stunned, right? It's again, people write about her as being so uh, beautiful and beautifully dressed and interested in these frivolous things. She's not actually romantic. Uh, you know, her marriage to Galt was pretty um, mercenary in some ways. The president, on the other hand, is super romantic, which surprises you if you think of him as that like incredibly buttoned up Presbyterian minister type, right? Like Teddy Roosevelt called him the apothecary's clerk but he writes these very, very racy letters <laughs> to Edith. And, you know, she starts to sort of respond in kind, but she's a little undone by the onslaught of attention. He proposes five weeks after they meet. She says, we don't even know each other that well. Your wife just died. What are you doing proposing? And she says, if it has to be yes or no today, my answer is no. Um, but let's keep seeing each other and get to know each other better and see what happens. And the letters from this time I find so fascinating because he is gushing, gushing, right? And he's going on and on about how he wants to kiss her eyelids and blah, blah, blah. And she writes back, I love your letters. Any woman would. It's so flattering for you to gush so. But you know what I really like? I really like it when you talk to me about policy. I really like it when you tell me what you're working on and uh, give me the intricacies of what's going on in your professional world. So he's Sure, he's all in, right? If flirting with her by policy analysis is what's gonna work, he's happy to flirt with her by policy analysis. So he starts sending her packets of sometimes actually pretty sensitive material. <laughs> and, you know, he runs his draft of the letter to the Germans following the sinking of the Lusitania by her. He um, it solicits her opinion about stuff that, again, in hindsight, why, why would she have an opinion about these things? She's never been in politics. She never went to college, but she turns out to be the kind of woman who was more successfully courted by policy analysis than by the eyelid kissing stuff. And that's completely in keeping with who she was. Um, and so these letters and the packets of sensitive material going back and forth to her house in DuPont Circle keep up through 1915. By the end of the summer, they're engaged. Um, by October, they've announced their engagement. The gossip columns are vicious about her being in trade. Uh, there's a whole fake scandal about um, a woman named Mary Peck, who Wilson corresponded with er earlier, and you know, was she selling her letters? And it's all designed to sort of 
make Wilson put the brakes on because his own advisors are very worried that if he marries Galt before the 1916 election, any sympathy he has for being the grieving widower is going to be blown out of the water. But neither of them are all that, even Edith thinks, you know, maybe we should wait till after the election, which she assumes he's going to lose, by the way. She thinks he's going to be defeated in 1916 and they can have this nice Washington life. He prevails, they marry in December of 1915, and she becomes first lady, a job, as I've said, which has no job description. And she doesn't have children, his children are grown. She decides her role is to be Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. That's all her calling card said, Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. Her whole job is to be next to him and help him. And you know, most first ladies, who married the president, the eventual president younger, have been part of his coming to power, part of his early campaigns, part of his, you know, working through his ambitions with him, cultivating political connections. Uh, Ellen Wilson was this way. Um, but Edith comes in when he's already president. She doesn't need to be that person. She can just be with him. And she is very interested in being his closest confidant. And Wilson did not, ha he, he enjoyed his own counsel very much. <laughs> he did not rely on a huge raft of advisors, um, but he had a couple of close confidants and little by little, Edith becomes the closest of the close confidants. And um, she probably would have been a pretty great society hostess, but she's saved from playing that role by World War I. So, uh, 1917, U.S. is involved in World War I. She throws herself into wartime first lady. She figures that out. She joins the Red Cross. There's sheep grazing on the White House lawn. She figures out uh, what that sort of public uh, collective sacrifice role is as the first lady as a role model. And then after the armistice in 1918, when Wilson wants to go to Europe to negotiate the treaty himself, um, she goes with him. Now, there was a lot of back and forth about whether or not Wilson should go himself, whether he was diluting his moral authority by getting you know, his hands dirty with the nitty gritty of the treaty, but he clearly wanted to go. He was always gonna go. And she wanted him to get what he wanted. So she goes with him. Not only is she the first first lady to travel abroad, he's the first president to go to Europe while president. Um, either Taft or TR, one of them had gone to the Panama Canal zone. That was the only other time a sitting president had left the country. Um, so they go to Europe and, oh, this is their courtship picture. I think, you know, this was a, um, a sort of montage that was put in the papers. I think whoever did the photo editing on this sort of had a mean streak. Their teeth are not attractive in this picture, but uh, the press coverage got very caught up in the romance of the president, as you might as well imagine. Um, so they go to Europe and she's right there with the ruling heads of Europe, not as a plus one, but as the first lady of the United States. And that elevates the role of that office in a way it never ever had been before. Here she is standing next to Queen Mary, not because she's his date, but because she's just as an important representative of the US. Um, there is some hilarious stuff about this picture because one of Wilson's pant cuffs is rolled up. And apparently King George made fun of him for not noticing that his pant cuff was rolled up in the picture. Um, but so again, another chapter where she has no training for being a ceremonial wife on this level. She has not been like a lot of first ladies, the first lady of New Jersey or something before this. But yes, I'll go to France. Yes, I will be completely involved in these negotiations. Yes, I will stand next to Queens. I have no problem with that. She was that kind of a person. So then as um, Wilson starts to deteriorate in 1919, takes this ill-fated train trip um, and then collapses, ultimately comes back to Washington and has a massive stroke in October of 1919. If you take it all as the next chapter of Edith's story, it actually shouldn't surprise you that she made the decisions she did, that she was all about him. So hiding how sick he was from him in addition to the American public was totally of a piece of what she had done before, but also having the confidence to pull off a cover up on that scale, which is astounding when you think about it, right? That she managed to be enough of a guard dog that the truth really did not come out in any sort of 
there were rumors and there were people who got angry about it, but there was not a sort of national doubt. We just last week, somebody sowed doubt about whether or not President Biden was actually acting as president because he's not tweeting enough, right? Can you imagine it 100 years ago? Very different world. So she pulls it off. She is his gatekeeper. Um, we can argue about how involved she was and whether this first woman president stuff is valid and um, you know, what, why she had the motivation she had. There's a lot I think to mine there, but the fact remains she <clears throat> certainly did a completely unconstitutional job of stepping in uh, when her president, her husband was not able to serve um, the role he was elected to do. Uh, and then they retired to S Street and what is now the Woodrow Wilson House, our host today. I will say um, the other chapter I'm really interested in is her post Wilson life. Her own memoir ends on the day Wilson dies in 1924, but she lived to 1961. Um, this is one of her last public appearances with JFK. So, you know, um, and I think those are various sayers in the background there, some descendants of Wilson's daughter, Jessie. Um, so she was involved in democratic politics. She becomes the honorary chair of the Women's National Democratic Club. She speaks at the Democratic Convention in 1928. Her name is occasionally floated as a vice presidential candidate. She's, she's around and she very much serves as um, the sort of grand dame of first lady. She invites every first lady to tea um, and talks to them about what they can expect of their role. So I think there's a lot of very interesting 1924 to 1961 Edith life that is also very much largely ignored. So um, with that said, I know we want to have time for questions. Um, so I will stop talking and stop sharing my screen. Beautiful, that was really a great presentation, both Keith and Rebecca, thank you very much. We do have some questions, I think, um, but I, uh, the first question is gonna come from me. And um, Heath, if your daughter Annie is on, I would love to ask her about her experience doing the movie uh, with the Smithsonian. She is joining us right now. Um, so I will let her come on and um, let you maybe re-ask that question one more time. Sure. Hi, Annie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Um, I love that you accompanied your mother to make the movie for the Smithsonian. Can you tell us just a little bit how what it was like to a watch your mom in action, um, but b to learn more about Edith Wilson? So I've always kind of traveled around with my mom as she's kind of done her thing pretty much all throughout. I've growing up and stuff like that. I've been dragged to talks here and there, so. <laughs> You know, it's not surprising to actually watch her, you know, do her thing. Um, however, I've never seen her film anything. So it was kind of cool to see that aspect of it mm -hmm. and uh, really see kind of how documentaries are filmed because I've never been a part of that. I've never seen it. I really didn't even know how much work goes mm. into it. Um, because I was tired at the end of the day, like I was done, like I was hungry and, um, I just didn't think it would be, you know, so much effort put into it and to see it kind of play out and to see the final result, it looks really good. And I just learned so much on, uh, filming with it, like how the canaries were. And that was kind of interesting <laughs> to me that she buried her dead canaries, which is kind of weird. <laughs> but it's kind of funny or well, not funny, but interesting. It is funny. <laughs> and, um, you know, to go throughout the actual house um, and kind of have that space to yourself and really be able to see it in depth more than anyone else because you are there all day and you are looking at everything else is really interesting. Um, so, yeah. Great, that's, that's wonderful. And uh, it's always rewarding to hear, uh, you know, bring your child to work day. This was really, bring your child to work all day <laughs> all day we had to feed her skeeters hot dogs from next door to keep her energy up so um you That's know great. she did well she did she acted interested she played that role well and then edith's um driver's license she thought was pretty interesting remember the driver's yes. license that yeah. Sharon showed us yeah that was interesting yeah 
Well, anytime I think about Edith in Withville, I always think I need to stand up and sit up straight because as soon as you said that, I saw everyone on the screen who I could see kind of put themselves <laughs> up. We all have a grandmother who told us to sit up straight. Um, thank you, Annie. That was great. I'm going to go to the chat and ask some of the questions. For those of you who are wondering, uh, first of all, this is recorded. So if you miss it or you're fr you missed the beginning or you have friends you want to share with it, we'll this will be on our YouTube channel. Um, but also there are some links in the chat to, for instance, uh, the documentary Madam President can be watched on the Smithsonian Networks. Uh, and so there are some links there. If you are familiar with how the chat works, please go ahead and take the, copy those addresses down. Uh, one of the questions came in was, uh, what was the relationship between Edith Wilson and the daughters who were pro-suffrage? So how do you have a woman who is not for suffrage uh, with new three stepdaughters uh, who are pro-suffrage. So as I mentioned, I think Edith's relationship with suffrage is fascinating um, because you would expect her in all of her independence and her trailblazing to some degree as a woman business owner to also think that the franchise was hers to execute. Um, I think some of it is, uh, the, and actually Heath sent me a really interesting article from um, the with County Historical Association that talks about how socially it was um, it was not what nice girls did right that being sort of out front there uh, insisting on a voice in the man's sphere um, was anathema to the way she was raised and that is certainly an argument that was raised by a lot of anti suffragists that women should be proud of their role in the private sphere and that insisting on a role in the public sphere was somehow denigrating the importance of their life at home. Mm -hmm. um, I think also the National Women's Party activists who picketed the White House in 1917 were so directly criticizing Wilson that that just made her mad. <laughs> um, she was very protective of him uh, and his reputation. And they were out there with banners saying, Kaiser Wilson, take the beam out of your own eye. And she found them um, disgusting. Uh, in their uh, forwardness, but she also really didn't like that they were criticizing him. So I think in general, she actually had a pretty good relationship with Margaret and Jesse and um, Nell, Nell. I think that they knew that their dad really needed a wife and was um, not doing well as a widower. Um, and it sounds like they all coexisted actually pretty peacefully, um, but they disagreed and they just, I don't think they swayed the daughters. I don't think they swayed their father very much. And they certainly didn't sway their stepfather. I mean, stepmother. I, Wilson, you know, came around to supporting the federal amendment quite late. He had um, said that suffrage should be a state by state issue before that. And that was often sort of thinly veiled racism. It was a sense that uh, the reconstruction amendments had been federal overreach. And it was a way to keep Southern states uh, from feeling like um, the federal government was imposing too much on them too quickly. And a lot of Southern states were really not interested in enfranchising black women in any way. They were systematically disenfranchising black men at the time. So um, he finally supported the 19th amendment really after it was, the writing was on the wall after New York passed suffrage in 1917. He sort of realized that the democratic party was gonna get blamed. Um, and he as the leader of the democratic party for not supporting it and he needed to come around. So he was a reluctant um, adopter of the 19th Amendment. Another question came in from Lauren. How old is she in that last photo with JFK? And is her arm broken? It looks like it's in a cast. Yeah, good eye. It is in a cast. She's 89 in that picture. She died later that year. Um, the document Still beautifully dressed. Still beautifully dressed. And uh, there is recently an article about uh, how uh, JFK was influenced by, by, um, by Wilson. I think it just came out this week on my on my news feed of uh, there's all every single day uh, there is something about Woodrow Wilson in the news and I get it on my feed and just recently was about JFK being influenced by uh, Woodrow Wilson. Um, so we have the link to it. Uh, she's 89 in that photo. Yes. Uh, and then um, as noted, Edith Wilson's memoir ends with the president's passing, but my first edition is dated 1938. Why did it take so long to have it published? So I answered that in the chat, but the actual answer is that she wasn't a 
initially planning on writing a memoir necessarily. Um, but I would say everyone in the Wilson administration wrote a memoir. <laughs> I have now read all of them. Um, I see Garrett Peck on the call. I'm sure he has read all of them too. Elizabeth, I'm sure you have read all of them. I think everybody even tangentially involved in that administration wrote a memoir. And she got mad about some of them. She thought that they were not representing her husband in the way that she wanted him to be represented. And she was really dedicated to curating his reputation after he died. And so uh, in her telling, she sat down and started dashing off her memoir on the train while she was still sort of livid about the latest um, version from somebody else. Uh, and so that's why it was 14 years after his death. Uh, and then th the question is, does Edith have any relatives alive today? Yeah, I think Carrie Fuller's on the call with us. Um, so he uh, maybe maybe can write in the chat. We have Carrie, we have some cousins. Um, Farron, Farron Smith, who is on the call, uh, can also probably detail the uh, last, the cousins that are still alive and uh, Carrie, of course. So um, yes, there are quite a few still around. Yes. I, I do see Carrie on the call. And I should say that these, uh, these uh, talks are made possible through generous donations for our speaker series. Um, and this talk, for instance, is sponsored by Carrie Fuller. Uh, and our other sponsors are Ed Gerber, Nancy Bliss, and Chris Keller. So I thank all of them for making this possible. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, are there any other relatives? Farron, do you want to point out anyone or else someone else on the line? No. Any other questions? Um, I saw a question about Mary Peck. Um, how did Edith respond to Woodrow Wilson's relationship with Mary Peck? So Wilson had um, certainly an emotional, maybe a physical affair with Mary Peck. He certainly wrote her many, many letters that while clean, um, there was no eyelid kissing in his letters to Mary Peck. They certainly were confidential in a way that seemed a little inappropriate between married people. Um, and uh, she was very protective of those letters, but there were rumors that they were going to get released to the press way back in the 1912 campaign. That was when Theodore Roosevelt said, oh, you know, no one would believe Wilson as uh, a Romeo. He looks like an apothecary's clerk. And then um, his own advisors, Wilson's own advisors, um, mainly Secretary McAdoo, Nell's husband, um, who was in the cabinet, uh, so kind of cooked up this scheme to pretend to Wilson that Mary Peck was gonna release her letters to get him to maybe back off marrying Edith. So, so it's a little unclear what the end game was there. Um, so Edith knew about Mary Peck back in 1915 and decided to go ahead with her marriage to Wilson anyway. So in her words, she said, you know, I knew about her and decided there was no fire there, just smoke and um, it was all okay. So then in 1919, when they're on that ill-fated train tour, um, there is one day in LA that Wilson might actually get a chance to rest from his grueling schedule, but instead he has lunch with Mary Peck. And uh, Edith says she had to go and she had to approve it because otherwise the scandal mongers would make a big deal of her snubbing Mary Peck and, you know, that try to turn this old controversy into something real. I will say both Mary Peck and Edith wrote about that lunch and neither was especially kind about what the other woman looked like. <laughs> um, but for the most part, Edith won that battle, you know, she didn't need to worry about Mary Peck. She was the one who was married to him. So um, she could afford to be magnanimous about it for sure. Well, that wraps up our, our uh, the conclusion. She's bold, she's brave, she's complicated, <laughs> she's beautiful. Uh, so um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone. We do have one more uh, comment. Uh, Edith, Edith's great niece, Betty Evans is on the line as well. Betty's okay. grandmother was, was Edith's sister. And Farron, uh, today, uh, Edith has three relatives living who knew her, Carrie Fuller, Sterling Bowling, uh, our great nephews, and of course, Betty Evans, the great niece. So with that, her legend continues. 
Uh, and we thank all of you for coming today, joining us on the line. In two weeks, we will have a professor from the University of Virginia, uh, Philip Zellico, talk about the Great War. And um, it promises to be a wonderful talk. I look forward to seeing you then. I thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Heath, Lee, and Rebecca Roberts. My pleasure to have you today. And thanks to Andy Lee as well for joining in. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Have a great week.